speakers as well, so um, hopefully you'll find what we've got to talk about quite interesting. A um, little bit about, about Corso. We're actually headquartered in the UK. Um, we've got offices in, in the United States um, and in Melbourne in Australia. Um, we've got a, um, a healthy range of, of customers, you know, both across commercial, um, defence, education, um, not-for-profits, um, and we, we were founded by the former IBM Enterprise Architecture Tool Team um, because we wanted to create a, a very agile uh, software as a service platform using the latest technology you know, and bring that to market. Um, so we've got, we've got over 100 customers within Corso um, so, and growing rapidly. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current trends in enterprise architecture, um, touching a little bit on, on universities uh, in terms of how that affects some of the challenges universities are facing. Um, Craig will take us through how he's approached enterprise architecture at Plymouth University, which is yeah, an interesting story. Um, I'll, I'll finish with a little bit about agile enterprise architecture and what is it and how the market's changing, uh, what sort of things are useful for you to be aware of as you move forward on your EA journey. Um, and then we'll take some questions at the end as well. So, um, yeah, please feel free to stack up your questions or just save them until the end. And, and yeah, Craig and I will pick off the questions as they come through, and Dan will facilitate that. So feel free to to raise whatever you like. Okay, so yeah, current trends in enterprise architecture. So so EA is a uh, is is a hot topic today, um, especially when we're talking about uh, digitization and you know, people moving to mobile devices. Yeah, software as a service, be able to access information anywhere, any place. Obviously, that's that's important from a university point of view. So as you bring on uh, students into into your uh, establishments, and as you start to try and gain competitive advantages over yeah, other universities that you're competing with, uh, and and other commercial players as well, then it's it's very important that you start to look at what you've got, um, how you can manage change, you know, how you can actually handle disruptive technologies. So bring your own devices, that type of thing. Okay, so here's a little quote from um, UCISA. So really, they're looking at enterprise architecture um, as creating a strategy for changing your business and IT, um, but also looking at how you have standardization across both the business and IT, um, and how that affects the university operating model, i.e. the standard processes you've got on the go, the standard technology that you're using, and how you roll that out. And then also looking at what's the target state. Yeah, so where do you want to go with your architecture? Yeah, how does that affect uh, your ability as a university to deliver core activities, both educational and research? Um, and that's important as well because obviously yeah, funding comes from different areas of, um, of your organization. Yeah, so you may find your research areas are quite well financed as opposed to your standard educational areas. So, yeah, EA is really about bridging yeah, the business of being a university yeah, with yeah, your strategy and objectives and your deliverables, your delivery. And that's not really any different from um, enterprise architecture in any other really at all, um, apart from you may have different goals or you may have different ways of, of financing and, and, and achieving your objectives. So what's the value to, to your organization of having an enterprise architecture? And yeah, whether yeah, organizations know it or not, you already have an enterprise architecture. It's actually implicit in your organization. So you, you just may not have chosen to express it yeah, inside either some tools or models or some visualizations. So this is really about aligning the IT capability that you've got with your university's goals about making sure you're getting value out of any investments you put in, so your portfolio, your IT portfolio. Um, enterprise architecture can help you manage change um, with agility, so you can very quickly know what the impact of change is by changing a part of the architecture. So if you want to remove a, a system from your portfolio, what's the change on the business processes, the locations, the data, the underlying technology. Um, if you want to change uh, location, relocate, some aspects of your uh, university. Yeah, what does that mean for the rest of the occasions, technology, processes, capabilities? It's about making sure that you're really understanding yeah, how you're efficient from an organizational perspective. So what people you've got, what roles they've got, what skills they've got, and how to apply those to the, to the business. 
um, and making sure you've got efficiency in your IT operations. So looking for, for bottlenecks, yeah, looking for reusable processes, um, doing things in a leaner way. And a lot of this is about agility as well. So when we talk about agile enterprise architecture, we're not just talking about using agile techniques that you'd be used to in a, in a development environment, such as Scrum or Lean um, or Kanban boards. Yeah, it's about being more agile as, a, as an organization, as a business. So EA is helping you get better return on, on existing investments, so making sure you're using things properly, but also making sure you can manage and identify risk yeah, on any other investments you make in, the, in, your, in your organization. And it also helps you make yeah, procurement faster, yeah, simpler and cheaper. And again, especially in, in today's world where um, any department could buy any software yeah, um, on a SaaS budget yeah, or even yeah, use yeah, open source and free technology. Um, it's important that you, you're, you're able to actually procure systems yeah, within the landscape of what you're trying to achieve as, a, as an organization that has to come through the enterprise architecture. So what I was saying before is that it, it's, EA is explicit in your business. You have capabilities, you have business processes, you have data, you have technology, you have locations, you have organizational units. Um, it's whether you choose to make that explicit or not, so you can actually start to look at managing change. So people are on different journeys um, in their enterprise architecture. Um, the majority of organizations we're talking to, um, and especially in, in the university sector, um, are in levels one, two, and three. And what we mean by this, this is from Gartner, so it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, well-respected EA maturity model. Um, so. When you look at level one over here, we're looking at yeah, the EA team being created initially, yeah, looking at yeah, plan development, yeah, planning technical deliverables. Um, so really, you don't really have a, uh, an existent or um, an enterprise architecture that's being visualized. Yeah, level two is reactive, um, so you're looking at governing what, what people do, uh, training the team, making your stakeholders aware of enterprise architecture, creating initial deliverables. And level three is where we're looking at um, defining key metrics, yeah, using a tool in detail. Yeah, you've got compliant projects that are adhering to enterprise architecture, so you're governing what's going on, uh, putting standards out there. And then moving towards level four and five, um, where you've got a repeatable enterprise architecture process, it's well known, um, you've got communication programs in place, you've got broad support across the organization. Right over to level five, where the stakeholders' perceptions of what enterprise architecture is is extremely high. You've tied in the goals, the, the targets, the drivers. Um, it does drive change in the organization. Enterprise architecture is the place for the organization to go to to get change. And the, the process of doing enterprise architecture is seen as a capability of the business. So when you build a business capability map of your organization, you see enterprise architecture in there as a defining business capability that's critical to the path of the business. So when we talk about EA maturity, yeah, most organizations, not just universities, most organizations are in level one, two, and three. Um, there's, there's a few organizations level four and five, but, but they're getting there. Um, and enterprise architecture is having a resurgence in the past uh, two to three years. Um, we went through a bit of the doldrums uh, five to ten years ago um, in trying to prove its value. Um, we're now seeing the value come through, and especially as people realize they need to do this type of thing to be able to respond to the types of change we're doing now. Uh, in the digital world. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Craig so he can introduce himself. He's going to talk about how they're approaching enterprise architecture at Plymouth University. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Craig Douglas. I am the enterprise architect at Plymouth University. Um, I've been doing the role now for about three years, um, so we're, st <laughs> we're still fairly new. Um, but a little bit about Plymouth. Um, we've been educating people for around 150 years, and this goes right back to our early uh, maritime school days. Um, we're a fair size. We have 27,000 students and 3,000 staff, and, and keeping on top of the demands for change can be quite a challenge and, and this is where the drive for enterprise architectures come from. Um, we have 
had a practice since 2012, so that's four years, and as I said, I've been doing it for three. Um, a small team, two enterprise architects, myself and an enterprise security architect, and three full-time technical architects who work wonders and do just about everything. Um, we are part of a, a wider department which encompasses four business partners and two account managers who um, deal with the stakeholder engagement in the main and, and gather the, the demands for change. In effect, we are one joined up team in the Department of Strategy and Architecture within IT at Plymouth. Um, when we started, we had nothing. <laughs> we had a lot of information in people's heads, little bits on um, various documents in various formats from Excel to Word, um, lots and lots of pretty Visio diagrams, um, lots of information in SharePoint and SQL and Visual Studio repositories. Um, everything was disjointed. <laughs> if we, we didn't know where, what we had, where it was. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we still don't know where all of it is, but, but we're, we're gaining that knowledge very quickly. Um, this is a, oh, a couple of examples of, of what we had, so horrendous looking network spreadsheets and, and very, very pretty Visio diagrams of our network. Um, it's fine and dandy, and it, it shows us what talks to everything, but in terms of um, impact analysis that, that Martin mentioned earlier and, and figuring out what happens when and, and where we want to go next, um, the disjointedness uh, was causing us a problem. In addition, more spreadsheets, more Word documents with, with solutions outlined within it um, and an early stab of architecting our environment, um, but again the tools at our disposal, uh, very disjointed, um, very individual focused, um, keeping on top of, of the change within it, um, very time consuming. And with a small team, um, it, it, we, it was just never getting done. So we started to think of, of what we needed to do. Uh, we needed the team to be able to share information in, in a common format. We needed to access the information irrespective of what platform we're using. We have some diehard Windows users, some, some diehard Mac fans, and a whole host of um, various uh, personal mobile devices running iOS, Android, and, and indeed Windows Phone OS. We needed the repository to be always there. Um, I, I have a, a very bad habit of working late into the night at the weekends, and I needed to access it. I needed all the information at my disposal. Um, one of our policies down here is to promote the use of software as a service. So to follow our own um, dictate, um, that, that was a, a, a very high requirement for us. And whatever we chose had to be task orientated. Um, we had to be able to delegate tasks and, and get returns on, on that, those delegated tasks. Um, within a university environment, um, for me, the, the main challenge was um, it's, not, it's not one true organization. It is. It's the University of Plymouth, but there are a lot of smaller autonomous departments within it acting as small businesses, so it's more of a conglomerate style, and providing that one size fits all for everyone is extremely difficult. So we needed a way to um, bring all that together to provide a, a foundation to push out the benefits of enterprise architecture, and, and that's all tied in with the demand management in, in terms of um, getting away from who shouts latest and, and into the 
well, everyone's asking for this, and the, and the underlying solution could be. And so we engage with the business on a regular basis through our business partners and account managers and, and indeed ourselves, and, and find out what's important to them. It's, it's not just the overall organization, it's, it's what's right for science and, and what's right for uh, education and what's right for health. And, and try and draw common themes to push IT in the right direction. And we're starting to make headway in that, which is really good. Um, we did select uh, Corsa as our tool of choice because it, it ticked an awful lot of boxes for us um, in terms of the cross-platform, the always on. It's extendable and really easy to use. Um, certainly, I, I took to it within a couple of hours, to be honest. And so we're starting now to draw models. Some are quite complicated models um, of how systems interact with each other and how they look internally. Um, now, this is our way of gathering the information. As I said before, we 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 are still gathering an awful lot. Um, so we're gathering that, finding the touching points and driving the bigger picture. Um, it, it really is a learning curve, um, finding out when enough information is enough. Um, we, in the early days, very quickly went into uh, overdrive, really, and, and we want to know everything. It's not about knowing everything. It's about knowing enough to make sensible decisions. Um, this is one of the early examples. The, this is a, a data model. Um, horrendous. It's one of our simple ones, to be honest. Um, so this is probably too much information. But as, as we compound or, or as we join our data models together for the various systems, we can quickly see those interdependencies and, and we can draw them out in, in terms of impact. What happens if? And we can also use it to analyze to, to ensure that we are on track in terms of data governance and uh, uh, legal compliance. Oh. Now, all of this data is great, but the only people that really look at these drawings are architects. And the whole point of the enterprise architecture practice at Plymouth is to um, help inform key business, sorry, key business decisions. And so what we produce needs to be meaningful to the business. Um, early on, we, we drew lovely, big, horrendous, blobby Archimate draw, drawings and, and put it in front of the management team or, or other key stakeholders. They say, "Great, what's that? No, nope, don't understand it. Go away. Um, that's not good." So we learned early um, to to produce the views that that are meaningful. So um, what they were asking for were timelines. So on the screen there is is three different timeline views we've produced for, for various things. Um, and people start to understand and start to see those overlaps. Now, we tried a lot of different software and, uh, to, to achieve this, um, but people are just starting to get this now. And of course, all of this is related back to the underlying data that we've captured. Um, this when we produced it was a favorite. People like this radar style, style view. And so all the mappings on there are components within our system that we've defined and captured and have detail of and have timelines on. Um, but people like it compartmentalized. So, so we have a few um, themes running and, and the, the capabilities are mapped within um, that, that has gained a great deal of favor over the last few years, and it's easy for us to, to do this now. And of course, the, the good old fashioned bar chart, um, people understand them. 
and and it's about that. It's about communicating in a way that people understand. All the data is there. We we just need to expose it. And this is something we we would have spent days, weeks, and months trying to produce uh, using old style tools. But now we can do it within a few clicks and get something to to put in front of uh, the IT director or, or senior stakeholders to say, look, this is the size of the problem. Now we recommend this, uh, and they start to listen. And that's me. So it's it's back to Martin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So thanks, Craig. Yeah. So uh, so one of the things I'm going to do now is just take you briefly through some of the. Um, the areas of agile here, sort of relating back to what Craig's been talking about here, because Craig's yeah, pushing the boundaries a little bit. So, uh, and to thank Craig as well, Craig has, has been one of the early adopters of our software. So, um, we've been yeah, out with the software for, t for two years now. Um, so, a lot of the things we put in um, were, were really about agility and about how do you really use enterprise architecture, how do you collaborate, and how do you communicate. And a lot of it is about you know, you know, speed of implementation. Yeah, versus the ability to support um, that environment, yeah, but bringing it in a high area of usability. So tools have been weak before because of um, yeah, they've been non-standard. Um, yeah, a lot of people are using yeah, Excel, PowerPoint, and Visio, okay, which which may mean you get yeah, something that's very usable, um, but it's very hard to maintain in terms of an enterprise architecture tool set. So, so we're aiming for to be a yeah, to get a high speed of implementation, yeah, high usability, yeah, so it's adopted very quickly. Um, and in terms of maturity, it, yeah, your your architecture becomes mainstream in the organisation. Uh, and some of the things Craig was, was talked about there, um, in terms of yeah, being able to yeah, visualise information very quickly yeah, it, within a few clicks is, is very very important. Yeah, so you're doing as little work as possible. Um, you've got information in one place. So. How are we solving this with with, the, with our platform? Um, it works on it, it's mobile. It works on any device. It's extremely engaging. Um, we've gone through um, at least three user interfaces now uh, on the tool within two years. Um, so um, yeah, we built technology. We know we can change very quickly. Yeah, we know we need to adapt it as yeah, moving forward. Um, we're using uh, Google Material Design as our thing on the way through. So. Buttons and icons, the way that we do things, should be very common. Uh, it uses things like Kanban boards, so you can have team views. Uh, and, and again, some of this yeah, is probably not applicable until you get a little bit mature in, in the organization. But you can use the tool in any maturity. So you can do lightweight sketching in it, and it still saves in the repository. You can import from, from spreadsheets, etc. Okay, so we're supporting uh, core EA disciplines. Okay, so one of the challenges for us um, is yeah, what is a what is an architectural framework that's that can be usable across the whole organisation? Um, and we we put two inside the tool. We've got Archimate, uh, and as Craig said, yeah, you show an arch, you show a complex Archimate model to an executive, yeah, you'll get thrown out the room. <laughs> and so so what we try to do is also provide views on the underlying model information uh, that make it accessible to executives and other stakeholders that may not be interested in the detail. So we've got things like pivot tables and roll-ups and charts, etc., as well as some very simple diagrammatic views as well. Um, supporting all the, the core EA disciplines, so business capabilities. Um, one thing again, Craig touched on was demand generation. So managing demand in the organisation, um, we've got an innovation management piece inside our platform. So you you can actually go out and do surveys and run campaigns, yeah, and capture information from. Um, Different stakeholders and different groups and different communities into the platform and start to manage that information in one place. So again, one single source of truth. Uh, business processes, applications, yeah, uh, data and, and technology architecture are all available. And then what we've also got there um, is pure SaaS. It's completely customizable. So we we do have people using our tool um, to do different things, not just the EA. We've had people customize our tool to do product management, yeah, manage agile development projects, because you can add your own types of objects into the platform and use them on Kanbans, for example, within a team. Um, native support for Archimate and Turgo, I've mentioned. Uh, we've also got yeah, high collaboration, so we've got role-based access. 
So if you've got private information that you only want to, a certain set of people to see uh, in your architecture, um, then you can create a community, a team of people that can only access that information. That, that information is only accessible to, to those team members, which is great because you know, how many times do you have to manage a Google Doc or a Word document or a PowerPoint and put protection on it? It becomes impossible once you start working with large sets of disparate data. Um, most modern tools do global searching and tagging as well, so as part of your collaboration, you can tag things at will and then just search, you know, search on those tags. So you can do sort of informal, um, informal architecture if you like. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, innovation, managing demand, managing campaigns, be able to public, you know, produce publications. So you, know, you don't have to be an expert in writing word templates you know, to get documentation out of the tool. You can just put things into a PDF. And we've got a lot of basics in place. Um, so you know, we can integrate with LDAP, um, and we've got an Active Directory server running where you can come and test out Active Directory and play with it, that type of thing. So we, we manage you know, large sets of users. We also have different licensing models as well. Okay, so that's one thing you have to understand quite clearly up front when you plan out um, an EA initiative and when you plan out tooling is what types of users have you got because not everybody is going to be a full-blown architect. So you've seen in, in Craig's team, yeah, he's got two, two full uh, full-time enterprise architects, three technical architects. Okay, and that those people are going to probably be using a tool every day. But then you've got other stakeholders that are interested in reviewing what you've done. So maybe you've got application owners. So what we have on the platform is the ability to have users, um, collaborators, people that are just doing review, reviews. They can come in, they can review an asset, they can tag it, they can put their comments on it, they can be part of the email notification system. Um, and you're collaborating with them. And you're actually now, if you think about that maturity model, yet you're now making your EA mature, you're now making it a fundamental part of the fabric of the organization. And then we've got an, an API. So if you want to plug it into yeah, different tool sets or you want to work with different tools, um, we've got an open API um, using REST um, so you can get your information in and out. So what we're doing here is we're managing the overall process. Um, yeah, we're, the information inside the repository uh, is consistent. So we've got standards and the standard notation in here. If you're using other tools, so if you're using single tool environments like Archie, then there is the ability to bring Archie models directly into the tool using the, the open group exchange format. So Corso um, were one of the three companies you know, along with the open group and Archie to put the interchange standard together for Archimate. Um, so again, you can use Archie with our tool and just bring those models in. Um, everything's in one place. So yeah, you don't need to go and redo a whole set of PowerPoints if you change some underlying times or date attributes on your delivery models. Those roadmaps refresh automatically. Um, and again, coming back to Craig, what Craig said there, yeah, a big part of this is analytics, heat maps, and roadmaps. So providing what if analysis. So again, if I change something in the architecture, you know, what's the impact on the rest of the, the organization? And I'll show you a slide that, that gives you an idea of what that means. But overall, you've got a single place to hold all your architectural information. It's a single source of truth. You change it in one place, um, and you're managing it in one place. And if you think about it, yeah, the, the amount of uh, intellectual property, yeah, and the amount of intellectual capital yeah, that you're describing in your enterprise architecture, yeah, it, it's obviously important. Yeah, like you'd file at home yeah, all of your important documents, you should be filing your enterprise architecture and putting it in, a, in, a, in one place where people can go and access it with restriction and access rights. So it mentioned representational consistency. Okay, so that means we've got different views. So yeah, you don't want to see a thousand objects on one diagram. So you can create different diagrams with different sub views on here. Um, so what you're seeing here is a, yeah, an application view you know, showing you know, claim data management at, at the center there and how it's connected to risk assessment and damage claim data. And you're seeing the same um, application claim data management here in the service viewpoint, yeah, but now you're seeing it with yeah, which business processes does it support, yeah, which application service does, does it provide. So different views, and those different views are useful for different types of people in your organization. Okay, the, we're importing on here, so 
again, yeah, bringing in that office information, yeah, you need to start gathering information from within the organization. So you, your first port of call on, on here yeah, is to start looking at an inventory of what you've got. And as Craig said, yeah, a very common mistake is to take everything that you've got and put everything inside the tool and try and make sense of it. Okay? And actually, probably what you want to do is probably in a controlled manner, just bring in what's important for you to achieve a particular objective. So if your objective is to cut down your application costs in your application portfolio for this year, just start looking at applications and business capabilities. Um, yeah, just do what you need and bring in what you need. But we can bring in from Visio, spreadsheets, yeah, and the, the open group, yeah, exchange file format, as I mentioned already. So diagrams are obviously, yeah, as part of an enterprise architect, yeah, a visual representation yeah, is very important. Okay, so again, there's about 30 different views in here, but you have got the option of building your own views in the repository as well. So you can create your own diagram sets. So if you've got somebody that, for example, an IT director that understands business capability and applications, uh, that may not necessarily be an Archimate or Tocaf viewpoint, but you can certainly build the viewpoint so that the diagram yeah, only presents to you capabilities and applications. And that customizability, the ability to change different views for different users, is an important aspect of enterprise architecture. You want to also manage teams. Okay, so um, you can have what we call Kanban boards. These are like having the post-it notes um, of work that you're carrying out. Now, if you start to apply the concept of a Kanban board, which is basically having stages um, and being able to move work between different stages, in this example here, we're showing things we parked, things we're going to do, things we're doing, and then things we've completed or done. Um, if you start to apply that to architectural assets, it starts to make a lot of sense. So if I start to say, right, we've got some work to be done on this piece of technology, or we're looking at a Windows upgrade to this version, then we can start to, to say, right, we're doing yeah, a Windows upgrade. That might be a work package, but it might also affect these applications, these technologies. We can start to put those onto a stage in the doing stage, and then we know that people are working on it. And we can have different owners of the stages, we can have different people collaborating. And you know exactly where the work is, and you know exactly what you've got parked on the left-hand side, and what you've got to do. And you can have lots of these Kanban boards for different teams with different aspects of the architecture. And it's a great way of managing work, because again, you're going to have lots of different types of objects you know, in your repository, you need to be able to manage it. Okay, decision making and, and impact analysis. You know, these types of views are often useful if you want to highlight and demonstrate the impact of change. You know, so again, here we're looking at an application in the middle of the, the view here. Um, but this application is tied to business capabilities, business processes, uh, locations, different actors. So actually making a change to that application, or just even upgrading it to a new version, you know, although it might seem quite a, quite a low impact change, you know, putting it into an impact diagram starts to show me the effect of that change and I can demonstrate the downstream effects of, of that change you know, to other people you know, and other collaborators in the organization. Okay. And again, yeah, as you've seen with, with, with Craig's view, using these live road mapping views that, you know, are, are really useful. Yeah, and I know that I have previously, yeah, in other roles, spent, even as a product manager, I've spent hours and hours changing PowerPoint slides yeah, to look visually good to show the roadmap for the next six months. And then it's put away and never used again. These are very interactive. These are directly change. And you can create application roadmaps, technology roadmaps, work package roadmaps, product feature roadmaps, roadmaps for anything you like that's got a time value. So it might be with delivering a particular business capability or a particular driver or goal. Um, when's the application live? Or when's the application, when are the applications being retired? Those types of roadmaps. Okay, now obviously you know, what you expect with, with modern tools is, is collaboration, so the ability to have comments and, and tasking, um, notifications, being able to use mentions with the at symbol. Um, again, it's, it's, this is about you know, moving up the maturity model you know, and allowing you to have collaboration in the organization. So you've got buy-in around your architecture. And it, you, know, it, you, you won't do this type of thing you know, off the bat, so it's not a matter of getting a tool on day one, in, you know, using a tool, and then yeah, adding in lots of users. You've got to build this type of collaboration over time. Um, and what I'm showing you here is really some of the end goals you can try and get to in terms of maturity uh, with, with tooling. 
Okay, so yeah, getting started with those, um, yeah, there, there's no software to implement, yeah, you can log online, it works. Uh, we're trying to disrupt the market a little bit with, the, with this technology, in fact, well, a lot. Um, so we're, we're trying to bring down the, the cost of these tools so that, that you can get into, into tooling quite quickly. So as an organization, our culture is about lowering the average cost of tooling for, for, for EA users. We're well aware that yeah, for the more traditional tools and the older tools, you're paying something like £10,000 a license. Okay, so we're trying to, to really say, look, yeah, EA is keen. Why can't you use EA like you use Microsoft Office or Visio? Um, and everything's maintained, so there's no, you don't have to go out to IT and get IT to install the software for you. It, it's all running for you. Uh, we're running up, upgrades and updates you know, every couple of weeks with defect fixes along the way. Um, and we provide discounted pricing for, for education and non-profits. Okay, so this is all about uh, getting people on board and using the software. Okay, so, so at the end there, that was a little little plug at the end there. But hopefully, you know, between Craig and I, we've given you a, you know, a lot of information there about how, you know, what, what are the current trends in enterprise architecture in terms of what are people using it for, um, what approaches has Craig and Plymouth and his team um, been taking, why have they used a tool like ours, what were the drivers, and I'll take you through some of the capabilities of, of agile enterprise architecture, which isn't just about building models, it's about collaborating um, and participating together. So at this point now, what I'm going to do is, is open up the floor for questions um, through Dan, if we've got any. That's great. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for the good presentation. Um, I'm just going to take a look to see if we've got any questions. So if you do have a question, now is the time to submit it into the, the little question box you should see on the GoToWebinar control panel. You can see we have had a couple of questions already, so I'm going to start with those. Um, Okay, first one uh, maybe for you, Martin. Um, if you must think to make enterprise architecture management agile, or let the EA team support, or sorry, or let EA support agile teams development solutions using Scrum. Okay, so so so, so I think I mean that's an interesting question because I think if I've got the context of the question right, but if this is about yeah. Agile enterprise architecture versus yeah, why not let agile teams use, use Scrum in, in development yeah, and let that handle the the architecture. And I think that actually yeah, it's probably because we're looking at different solution spaces. So yeah, with enterprise architecture, we're really talking about um, mapping out the the processes, the organisation, the data, location, systems, and technology, and the business capabilities. Um, and you you can do that in, a, in an agile manner. We're promoting yeah, you only do enough, just enough architecture. Yeah, to solve a particular business a business problem. Yeah, otherwise you're probably boiling the ocean. Um, and yeah, development teams that are using yeah, agile development and scrums, yeah, and, and we do agile development here ourselves at Corso. Yeah, so we're we've got an agile development team. Um, yeah, that's using some of the same techniques. Yeah, so Kanban they have Kanban boards and they have issues and, and logs and requests. Um, but they're not necessarily looking at the bigger picture of how everything pe yeah, is, is pulled together and they're certainly not looking at the processes in the way that our organization operates um, so again just different, different solution areas yeah, using some similar techniques but different solution areas and certainly a different meta model like TOGAF or Archimate yeah, being used at the, the higher level rather than to do software development so if I may um, we at Plymouth have agile teams in, in our development area um, very good agile teams and, and they develop very quickly. Um, we aim within enterprise architecture to be agile in our own right in terms of responsiveness um, but by setting down the right governance and um, policy and standards um, from the centre um, we help those agile teams make the right choices at the right times. It, it, and in that, it's about the collaboration. So, so if there's a case of uncertainty, uh, check with the architecture teams, and, and crack on and develop the way you always have. Um, but, but we're putting frameworks in place to allow that to happen. Um, so it is that collaboration across teams, across departments, all pushing towards the same goal. That's interesting, Craig. So, Craig, so, so would you let your? So, do you let? Have you thought about letting your development teams? collaborate as part of the architecture? 
we have. Um, they're, they're not quite ready to take it on board yet, is, is, is the steer that I'm getting. Um, but we tend to put um, one of our technical architects with, with those teams to, to bounce ideas off. Um, and, and certainly they, they go to project stand-ups and, and are available for consultation. Um, so where the teams themselves are uncertain, they have the skills of the architect there at their disposal. And yeah, ultimately, yes, I, I'd like them to, to delve in and be part of the, the bigger environment, if you like. But, but we're not there yet. Okay. That's great, thanks. Um, let me look here, so another question. Uh, okay, um, can you describe how Corso can be used to evaluate multiple alternative future states? Okay, so, so that's going to get better in the next week or so. Uh, so at the moment then, you do have something called an implementation and migration view, which lets you show plateaus and how you, tr you transition between different plateaus. Um, so a couple of things there. Um, so that, that's okay in terms of you know, drawing a visualization. But when you want to work with architectural assets, so you're doing a, a current state versus maybe several alternative states, um, then you really want the concept of workspaces. And, and that's coming out in the next week or so. It's currently in, in beta testing. And that's the ability to create different workspaces within your architecture. So you can have a current state. You can have a, a target state one, target state two, target state three. You can look at the, the gaps between them. Um, and if you're interested, this is a really big area. And I, we've run webinars on this before. Um, I will probably do some more in the future. But we've got an e-book an e you know, which has a couple of chapters in there on how to plan out um, current and future states. And also how to use things like the road mapping tools. We've got the road mapping visualizations to look at a current state and a future state. Um, and then we, uh, we've, got some, we've got some really cool tools then for doing things like publications. So if you want to do an as-is versus 2B architecture, put them into different workspaces um, and then just yeah, publish the alternate views inside the one document. So you've got a, co a comparison document just to visualize and send that to different stakeholders. So we, we can do a little bit of that now, but we're going we're to be much better in the next week or so. Excellent. Thank you. I don't know, Craig, if you've got anything to add to that, Craig, you're, you're, you haven't worked with it much in terms of that, have you? But... No, no, we haven't done, done a great deal with that at all. Uh, but we will be, I hope. <laughs> it's good to hear. <laughs> um, okay, next question. So, uh, is the data import tool slash functionality included in the basic price? And how advanced is it, for example? Can you connect? to and sync with other systems. OK. Um, so I, I guess one is a, a pricing question. So yes, every type of user that's on the platform can imp actually. So yes, if you yeah, if you buy a user license for our, our products, then it's import and export is included. Um, however, because of the way the licensing works, you can assign different users to different types of license. So for some users, you can turn import export off. Um, in terms of how advanced is it, um, it's it's a we've got a tab separated value format, which means you can um, you can export everything in terms of every object type, all of its attributes, all of its associations, um, and you can import those in as well. If you've got objects, so let's say for example you're an applicate set of applications. Those applications link to locations and technologies and processes and capabilities. Uh, then, if you bring in the, all of those applications with those links, it'll create the whole network for you, including all the processes and capabilities. So, in terms of an import tool, compared to some of the older, more traditional tools, it's very advanced because normally they're just exporting one object at a time. Um, it doesn't sync with other systems, so you'd have to use the API to do that. Um, and then we have some dedicated import tools as well. Um, so tools like an Archie open group import tool, um, which is just the open group file format, and can do other tools like BizDesign, because that supports the open group interchange format. Um, and then we've got Visio import as well, which is dedicated. And we're now working on a Sparks importer. But Sparks is very different, because Sparks is really a UML tool with a set of profiles on top. Um, so we're now looking at how do you map you know, uh, 
Sparks and a UML profile into our our own metamodel, and that that works underway at the moment. So, uh, Craig, uh, Craig, I don't know. Have you, did you use any of the import tools? Like We've um, yeah, we use the the flat file um, spreadsheet TSV importer. Uh, that works really well. Um, really good way to take all of our old assets uh, and get them in. Um, and then we can start playing with them properly. Uh, we've used the Visio importer, uh, and some of our Visio drawings weren't, weren't brilliant, but, but the functionality of getting it across and into the new system uh, is excellent. Um, but that's about it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on the API, to be honest, because that will save me a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 the, so the API is interesting. So the API is brand new for us. Uh, we've got our first couple of customers that have been using it. Um, and in fact, after this call, I've got one of our one of our customers demonstrating back to, to myself and our development team of how they've integrated Power Microsoft Power BI um, with our with our information and our data via REST. So that, that'd be interesting. But the API is the way we're going with the, so so the API is the way we're going with all data in and out of the tool. Uh, we've also been playing with um, linking into yeah, some other tools. Uh, primarily, one of them is called Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R. So we've been playing with that, um, and we managed to get information going between our tool and Jira. Uh, we've been using things like um, you know, different types of personal Kanban boards, um, and moving information between different you know, iPhone Kanban boards, and uh, all sorts of wonderful things using, using that tool. OK, excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so another question, I think this, this one's uh, for you, Craig, and maybe follows on a little bit from what we were just talking about. So how did Plymouth go about adopting and migrating to the tool? Um, I guess we were lucky, really, um, because all of our existing data was in such disparate systems. Um, we didn't have a, a great deal of trouble um, or need to, to import vast amounts all at one time. Um, but we did evaluate um, various other offerings. Um, and for one reason or another, they, they didn't tick the boxes that we needed. Um, so it was down select and, and choose, find the, fu find the funding and, and go for it. And pretty much as, as Martin said earlier, it's log on and start using. Um, it's very familiar if, if you're used to, to Archimate systems. Um, it's extendable, which is a big part of what we like. Um, you can change the underlying metadata to, to suit your needs, um, add new metadata, take out ones that, that doesn't suit. Um, so we found it ultimately flexible. and. Like I say, because a lot of our stuff was in spreadsheets and in word format and then this, that and the other, there wasn't a great deal to, to import. So we just started using it and started playing. And, and um, we did go through a period of, well, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but we're getting the, the results. So um, it, it became very much a, um, this is the way we're going to use it. This, this is the way we're going to use the tool. This is the information we're going to present to our stakeholders. And, and the, the Corso tool is, is flexible enough to allow us to do that. Um, yeah, that was it, really. It, right. it was just straightforward. It just worked. That's excellent. And it, it also leads on, actually, a little bit to uh, another question that I have here. So are you able to use the tool if you aren't rigidly following TOGAF? Uh, for my point, yes, really. Um, we are all TOGAF trained, um, and we use um, an adapted TOGAF framework um, just by the nature of, of the way we need to work within the organization. We're, we're seated in, within IT, and we need to spread out across. Um, so, so we aspire to that, um, that TOGAF mentality. Um, but yes, no, use it, don't use it. It, it would work with any framework or, or without, really. Um, if you know what you're trying to achieve, go for it. It, it, will, it will more than likely work for you. 
Yeah, and just just to add into that as well. Um, yeah, as I said, so so we we use the tool here ourselves in 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 both. So we use it for do our own architecture of the business, um, but we also use it to do product management as well and development. So um, we've we, we, we've got completely different models in here for a meta model. So we don't have Toga for or Archimate for doing product development. They started off using they've used three tools actually. They started off when we first started the product, developing it four years ago. They started using Jira, uh, managing issues. Then they moved to Rally, um, and then yeah, about a year ago they moved from Rally to our own platform. And then yeah, we're able to do everything they could do in Rally from a product development perspective inside our tool. So so that's using a different meta model, which is yeah, products, user stories, product releases, themes, features, issues, etc. So you can use it for whatever framework you want, but out of the box, obviously we we provide Archimate and Togaf. But yeah, as Craig said, yeah, you can customize it and, and tone it down in terms of maturity. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, another question here is, uh, what is the front end for consumers of the outputs, i.e., not the content creators? Uh, do you have a portal, for example? Okay, so yeah, so so you can publish at the moment from a, an underlying model to um, either PDFs, so people can consume the models as part of you know, a document, yeah, you know, or, or any view at all. So once you've got the underlying content, you can say, right, I want to look at that inside a pivot table, or I want to view it as a as a roadmap, as you saw, or a diagram, and put those into a, a PDF automatically, or save it as a PNG file. Um, or you can collaborate around the, the model itself, but also you can just add people in to review the form as well. So, so when you're looking at an object, you can add in the reviewers to come and comment about the, the object itself. Or you can even publish to a URL on the web, which is effectively like a portal, and, and basically build a document or a, a web page view from the underlying views, which is consumable by different stakeholders. So. Yeah, that's great. And you can also edit those uh, the documents as well, can't you? Before you, you publish them, I think. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. And do the formatting and things. Okay. Um, so one for you, maybe Martin. Uh, how does uh, BPMN 2.0 link into developing Agile EA? Okay. Um, okay. So so the then. And this gets interesting because, as I mentioned at the beginning, so I was one of the original authors of BPMN. Uh, so I worked on BPMN 1. And BPMN 1 was a lot simpler than BPMN 2 so, um, and 1.1. 1 .1. Um, so BPMN does link into, and, and you can link it into Archimate and TOGAF. Um, so you can use uh, business processes um, at, within Archimate as activities within BPMN. You've got events in BPMN and events inside Archimate. So from an underlying model perspective, it's the same event sequences, processes, gateways are the same as events, processes, junctions in Archimate. So the actual semantic meaning of the model is the same. It's when you start to layer on other BPMN2 advanced aspects that your model becomes different. Um, so we don't support at the moment BPMN2 inside our tool. And again, that is something we're developing at the moment. We've got developers working on that now. Um, that will be available. I would have thought in about four to six weeks' time. Um, we've been working on it for quite a while. But we're not going to go into BPMN2 execution, but we're going to be using it to allow you to draw a process in BPMN2 notation on the same underlying meta model that you've currently got inside the tool. So it should be compatible with exactly what you've got. Um, so, so BPMN2 sits, sits nicely, actually, with, yeah, within the process business layer you know, of architecture, yeah, if it's used in the context of doing that. If it's used in the context of deploying into a, a business process execution engine, yeah, then I would class that as solution design and solution architecture, yeah, and, and it's something our tool is not really going to be going to be covering moving forward. That's excellent. Okay, thanks, Martin. Thanks, Craig. That's actually uh, the last question that we had here in the... Uh in the panel and I think the timing's quite apt actually so our, our uh, the hour is almost up so um, with that I think I'd like to thank everybody for joining today's session um, 
you know, please uh, take the time. There's a couple of links there you can see on the screen. You know, visit the Corso website. Do take a look at the uh, the Plymouth EA blog. Very interesting stuff on there. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, again, I'd like to thank Martin and uh, Craig for the, the good uh, Q&A and also the presentations today. And uh, I hope to see everybody on another webinar in the future. So uh, thanks and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.